we'll say. All right, so let's get into this. Let's say we're going to go through some cryptology fundamentals. And when we talk about cryptography, cri cryptography is the science of encrypting information. So there's a difference between encryption and cryptography. And when we talk about encrypting, that's scrambling data so that anybody who is unauthorized, any unauthorized party is unable to unscramble and read it. Now, the thing that it supports, as we look up here, everything from uh, confidentiality, integrity, non-repudiation. I'm sure you guys all remember what non-repudiation is. Uh, authorization and, and access to information. And really, it's a pretty simple concept where we start with what we call plain text, run it through a cipher uh, with a key. And from that and the encryption key, out of that, we get cipher text. And then it has to be decrypted with some type of key uh, to be returned back to plain text at the other end. So some terminologies just to be aware of. Like I said, we talked about the term cryptography, a method of storing and transmitting data in a, in a form only intended for authorized parties. Now, encryption is the method of transforming um, data from plain text into an unreadable format. That is encryption. Okay, so when you think cryptography, it is the end-to-end -end process. You have encryption is the front end, decryption is the rear back end. Those two together makes up the, the cryptography process. Plain text, like we talked about, that's your, your data when it's in a readable format. Cipher text, that's when the, uh, the data has been scrambled. And two other really important things is the algorithm. And when we talk about the algorithm, that is the, the rules or the, or the set of rules or procedures that dictate how encryption and decryption will take place. Also, sometimes it's called the cipher, the, 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 the um, uh, algorithm itself. And then the most important, really, the most important part of encryption is the key. And when we talk about the key, that is what's used in the encryption process that's, that uh, generates the, the cipher, that's not just generate cipher, but is used within the cipher, within the algorithm to actually do the encryption. So when we talk about the key itself, really, when it comes to cryptography, key management, key generation and key management, really those are the uh, uh, two, two my, my microphone is over here in my way. There we go, getting a big shadow. Um, it's really the, the thing that, that we're dealing with. Not so much the algorithm. It, it comes down to what we call Kirchhoff's uh, principle, where Kirchhoff's principle says that the algorithm is not what we want to protect. It's the key. Uh, now, when we're talking about that, uh, we, what the, the whole process of encryption is remembering that it's about what we call the workload factor. We want to make it very difficult for someone to be able to, someone unauthorized, to be able to, to crack the code and break the key. Any key is crackable, okay? Any key can be, can be cracked, even a one-time pad. I know you probably say, well, what about a one-time pad? Well, one-time pads, yeah, if um, you give someone enough time and with enough money, enough workload, it can be cracked. So that's why protecting the key is very critical, very important, uh, to how you distribute and store the, the, your, your, your key. All of these things listed on this slide, very, very important, how we do key management, key escrow, uh, all of those different things, extremely important when we talk about the key. So now let's talk about the, the, the cryptography process. How do we scramble data? Really, it comes down to about two methods, substitution, what we call confusion, and transposition, which is diffusion. Substitution, well, let's talk about uh, transposition. Transposition starts out with what we call a Caesar cipher. And what a Caesar cipher is, this is how Caesar, you know, the Roman uh, emperor, Caesar, who had all these outposts that, you know, across the, the entire Roman um, uh, empire. And he wanted to be able to communicate with his outposts and he wanted to be able to do it securely. So he started doing encryption. He would take a wooden dowel of, uh, you know, of a given size, wrap a piece of paper around that dowel like this and write his message on it. It says what, send help. Okay, now when you unwrap that, now you see everything has been transposed. Letters moved and shifted all over the place. So if someone stopped one of his, uh, his runners and they saw this thing of letters, it would make no sense. Why? Because it was encrypted. Now, when he got to the other end, got out to the outpost, the, uh, 
individual at the outpost, he had a wooden dowel that was the same diameter as the one that Caesar had. So then he would take that piece of paper, wrap it back around that dowel, and now that transposition would be retransposed back to the message, send help. Okay, so that's transposition. Now substitution, on the other hand, <clears throat> that's when we substitute one letter or one item for another. This right here is called a, a, a rot, a rote uh, 13. I mean, I, I've rotate, I've taken the 26 letters of the alphabet and I've done a shift, basically rotated everything 13 positions. So now A becomes N, B is O, C is P. If you think about, you know, A is the first letter, B second, third. So if I count all the way down, M is the 13th letter. Now I start here, the 14th, all the way to, to the 26th. So now the uh, A, the, the one becomes 13. To B, which is the second letter, becomes O, which is the 14th. So I've substituted everything over. And I've done it in, 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 uh, with 13. Now, as simplistic as these sound, really this is still at the heart and the core of how we encrypt. Uh, I will tell you today though, however, you know, the algorithms that, that we use with, you know, it and NSA and, and other encryption algorithms, they run it through these processes multiple, multiple, multiple times and add many other things with it. But still at the end of the day, you're doing either confusion or diffusion. So when we talk about encryption, two basic methods that we do this, we do, that we encrypt, symmetrical, symmetric encryption and asymmetrical. So we're gonna talk about both of these. We're gonna, let's forget into symmetric encryption first. Symmetric, what does it mean? We think about the word symmetrical, what does it mean? Same, right? So it's symmetry, so the same. <clears throat> that is what we're talking about with encryption, meaning that this is sometimes called private key because to encrypt and to decrypt, you have to have the same key. So anyone with the key can either encrypt or decrypt. It's uh, secured uh, really by the uh, most secure distribution keys to both parties. You've got to get both parties who are encrypting and decrypting to have the same key. Now, what challenge do you think that brings? Yes, I heard someone in the East Coast just answer. Key management. Yes, key management is the big issue. Because now let's say that, you know, like when I was in the military, when I was in the Air Force, I, I was a comm guy. And we did a lot of some encryption, symmetrical encryption with KG uh, device, KG 40s, KG 30s, uh, KIVs 7s, and, and so on and so on. But the issue we would have, like I said, I could be assigned in Italy and we were on the same network with maybe somebody, a guy's flying in the airplane uh, or someone who's still in the United States. How do we get everybody the same key? That was a the 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 challenge and the way the military does it, they have the the uh, uh, KDEMS key distribution management system that p does that getting the keys distributed to everybody because everybody on the net would have to have the same key and all with the same key but the same key management because you we would have to change keys uh, periodically because you don't you only want to use a key for a certain amount of time so we would change keys either either weekly sometimes monthly. Well, here's the issue you would run into. Let's say that you, you know, you're in Seattle and you're communicating with me and I am in Europe, in Germany, or in Saudi Arabia. Well, if you think about time differences, so now everybody would have to be on the same radio day, meaning that all these keys, so, and we'd have to be synced to a time standard like Zulu or, uh, or, or, or Greenwich Mean Time. Otherwise, the people, you know, in, in uh, Europe, they're changing their keys before somebody in the United States. And now we're, we can't communicate because we're on a different key set. So that is the big thing with when we talk about symmetric encryption is key management. That is the, the, the big con. The, the pro, uh, the positive, the advantage, it is very fast to encrypt and decrypt with, with symmetric. So that is the, the, the advantage, disadvantage, key management. Now, how do we do this encryption uh, with uh, symmetric encryption? Basically two ways. And the way we do it the most is what we call block, block encryption. Block encryption takes a message that you want to encrypt and it breaks it up into a fixed size blocks. And then it encrypts each block with the key. Here's what I'm talking about. 
So let's look up here at the top. This is my plain text. I say this all this together is one message, okay? That's one, one set of plain text. What block encryption does is it breaks it up into evenly sized chunks or blocks. And then it applies the key to each block. And now we get ciphertext in blocks as well. And that is and then we transmit that, we whatever method we want to transmit that. That is the way block encryption uh, works. Now there are some advantages and disadvantages to block encryption. Um, one is, like I say, it's, it, it's fast. However, a problem you can run into with block encryption is crypto uh, uh, analysis, meaning that, that an crypto analyst who, let's say the bad guy, he, who's getting this information, even though it's encrypted, even though it's ciphered, they are looking for one thing, a pattern. In cryptology, once something repeats, they got you. They got you. Because once anything repeats, a letter, an alphabet, now I can start seeing the pattern. And with block encryption, because we're using the same key over and over and over again, it increases the likelihood of something repeating. So that is one of the, the, the drawbacks to, to this. Now, there are some things that we do to, to help diffuse that, uh, like cipher block chaining, CBC, cipher block chaining, or EBC. There's different techniques where we will take some of the cipher text here, feed it back into the plain text, I mean, back to the key, so that the key now has been salted or has a seed so it has, it looks differently. So now every block comes out looking a little bit differently. So there's methods like that that's used to um, reduce the, the likelihood of, of, the, of things repeating. Now, I, if you're gonna, looking at your certifications, this is an area, yeah, you need to know, I think it's about 20% or about 12% of your, your Security Plus and those certification talks about encryption. And you will be talking about CBC, cyber, uh, uh, block chaining, you know, cy cypher block chaining. Uh, there's about five or six blockchain methods that's used with block encryption. Now, here's some of the block encryption algorithms. Uh, data encryption standard, DES. Um, like I say, now this is a fixed block size of 64 bits. And we really don't use DES that much anymore. Why? Because the block size is small, but not only that, it's the key size. It's a 64-bit key, and really uh, the effective key is only 56 because eight bits is used for parity or checksum. So DES not really used because it's not that the workload factor to crack DES is pretty simple with the computing power we have with, with technology. So what they did in a, uh, the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology, they came up with triple DES, meaning that they would take your plain text and run it through the DES algorithm three times. So basically triple encrypted. So that made it a little more um, uh, secure. Another one is RC5, like I say, um, that's the uh, Revest cipher, cipher. Revest is the individual, if you ever heard of the term RSA, uh, they're the three individuals who did a lot of the mathematics to come up with these algorithms, but RC5, Revest, Cipher uh, version five. It's also a block cipher. Now this has very variable size blocks. Not that you can vary each block, but you select how what size you want your block to be. You can be, have a 32 bit block all the way up to 128 bit block. And also you can vary the key size all the way up to 2048 bits. So it gives you some latitude. And you may ask, well, what, why don't we just go to 128 and 2048 bits? key size, you know, 128 bit blocks. Well, there's trade-offs. In life, there's always trade-offs. The bigger the block size, the bigger the key, yes, it is, the, the encryption is better. It's more secure, but it becomes slower because now you got to think about the time it takes. I have a huge block and I have a huge key and I got to mesh these together to do the, go through that algorithm. So, and I'm doing this to hundreds of thousands of individual blocks. So now the time uh, collectively it takes to do that 
and the overhead it takes to do that it gets bigger and bigger. So what you do, you try to find a happy medium between performance and security. Now, the, where we're at today is AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. That is really the replacement for, for every, all these. And AES is a 128-bit block. And as you see, you got variable key sizes, uh, 128, 192, 256. And I think they've pushed it up past 256 now. So now, a, but that, this is the de facto standard for uh, uh, symmetrical encryption is the AES standard, okay? So really, most things you see now is uh, whether you're using secure socket layer, uh, TLS, you know, they're operating with an AES algorithm. That, that's what that is. All right, second method of, of doing encryption, um, symmetric encryption, is what we call stream encryption. Stream encryption. And what stream encryption does, okay, the key is used to, to, with a key stream generator which creates just a, a long seri series of bits. Instead of having a static key, now this key is continually being generated. Why do we do, why would you use stream encryption? Good question. I'm so glad you asked that question. Well, when you think about static data, like email, like a lot of things we do with the internet, um, uh, wanna encrypt a document, doing that type of encryption. Block encryption works very well. Why? Because we can break that message up and encrypt the blocks and send it out across the email or send it out across RF and the other end gets it and puts all the blocks back together and puts it in, and now you got your document back. But let's say if you wanted to encrypt uh, streaming media or as you're typing on a keyboard like with teletype or keyboard inputs and you want to encrypt that as is happening, now you need a different way of doing that. So that's why we use stream encryption so that now we can stream a serial bit, a uh, stream of bits. Some of the drawbacks to stream encryption, it uh, still uses an initialization vector, an IV. And there's some, and what that IV is, that's an, a random number, an arbitrary number uh, that's used along with the, uh, the secret key for generating your, your data. It's kind of, it's like a seed to get the, uh, the bit stream started. So some of the kind of a basic encryption, uh, stream encryption algorithms, you know, you've got Turing, I like say key size variable, uh, your initialization vector is 160 bits. Uh, RC4, which is again, reversed cipher four, he, he created a um, block and a stream encryption. And it has variable key sizes as well. And then you have VEST um, also. Like say, if you just in your security plus books, you're gonna see these, some of these, um, algorithms. All right, now, how does that work? So how do we do stream and streaming? Well, like a lot of our encryption is really built around a Boolean mathematical function that we call the exclusive or, the exclusive or function, uh, or XOR. Uh, so what, what that is, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get too deeply into Boolean math and, you know, AND gates and OR gates and then nor and NAND gates, but really we have to talk about the exclusive or to really understand um, stream encryption. Also realizing that this um, function is used in a lot of encryption algorithms. So what an exclusive or will do, let's say if you have two inputs, you will only get an output when the, the input one or input two is a one and a zero. So for instance, if you look at what we got here, input one is zero, input two is zero. On the output, we get a zero. Input one is zero, input two is one. On the output, we get a one. Input one is one and a zero, one. And even if they're both ones, one and a one on the two inputs, you still will get a zero. So that is the exclusive OR function. So now how does this work? Very simplistic um, um, simulation I have here. Okay, let's say that this, this these ones and zeros, these are our plain text, okay? And now we want, this is our key stream. This is our, our key that we're going to want to encrypt this with. So basically, we run it through this XOR function. So when the first one from our plain text comes down, it is XOR, it is uh, exclusively OR with our key bit stream. Oh, it's a one and a one, so we get a zero. The next bit comes down, it's a zero, plain text. 
the key bit stream is a one, XOR is a give us a one. The next one gives us a one. And just it just follows that pattern, a one and a one and a zero, and all the way down. So now you see that our cipher text is now zero one one zero one. So now we and this stream could keep, could keep going on and on and on and on. <clears throat> as long as uh, you know we can we can generate a key stream bit, it can keep going. Now you have similar issues though with stream is repetition. Because pretty soon, at some point, your key is going to repeat itself. Even if you're uh, using initialization vectors, if you're seeding it, salting it, doing everything else with it, it still will probably repeat itself. Then once, if it repeats itself, that's when a crypto analyst can start cracking the code. All right, let's shift to uh, uh, asymmetric encryption. When we talk about asymmetric, just like the term says asymmetric, now we're talking two things that are not the same. Symmetrical, same, meaning uh, private key, both parties need the key. Asymmetric, you, you got two keys, and they're not the same key, even though there's a relationship, but they're not the same. You have a public key, and you have a private key. And this is why we call this public key encryption, as opposed to asymmetric, was called private key encryption. So now what we have, like I said, we got plain text, it's gonna be encrypted, by a, someone's public key, turn to ciphertext, and it's gonna be decrypted by the, the authorized persons who needs to see it with their private key. All right, let's talk about this for a little bit. Like I said, there is a mathematical relationship between these two keys, between the public key and the private key. Now the public key is given, why they call it public? Because anyone can get access to your public, public key. It's made public. The private key is the one that we want to keep secret. You want to keep your private key secret. And in doing this, we can use our public key to encrypt the message, okay? But then the private key is used to decrypt. So meaning that if I had your public key, I can encrypt the message with your public key because I know the only person who should be able to decrypt it should be you because you're, you have the private key. Uh, we use it for, signing messages or digital signatures uh, th and the same thing. Now I will, I can use my private key to sign it because if I got the private key, that way it knows that I'm the only person who could sign it. But the somebody on the other end can use my public key to validate it because they know that this public key will only match up with the person who signed it uh, private key. So that's when we talk about asymmetrical. Again, uses two keys, one for encryption, one for decryption. Now, this is what asymmetrical does for us. Because the two keys are asymmetric, meaning that they're different, that takes care of, in a sense, the key management problem. I don't have to worry about just trying to distribute keys because I'm keeping my public key and I don't care who gets the private key. It kind of goes out there, anybody can get it. Okay, so that kind of mitigates some of the key management problems that we had with symmetric. Uh, it also is good for providing integrity and proof of sender or non-repudiation. Non-repudiation meaning that you can't deny it was you. So like I say, so if you send a, a, a digitally signed email from your computer, the uh, asymmetric encryption provides the non-repudiation that, yep, that came from this system drawback it is very slow very slow why because there's a lot of handshakes that has to go on to to, to set up the, the key uh the key management and things like that so it's very slow now what happens realistically often we use the two asymmetrical and symmetrical encryption in a hybrid system here's so what we do we use asymmetric to do key exchange. So now I can exchange my symmetric keys using asymmetric encryption. And now once I've done key exchange, I no longer use asymmetric, now I use symmetric encryption to do the actual bulk encryption. So that's how those two, most of the time, used together um, from that fashion. Couple of different algorithms you're gonna see when we talk about asymmetric encryption. One is RSA, 
RSA, that's that's one of the big ones we use. We use it all over the place now. If you go, if you're on the internet, if you're doing shopping, if you're doing, you know, on the web, uh, you go to websites, you'll see that they use AES along with RSA. Uh, second one is ECC, elliptic curve uh, crypto. Uh, let actually that is used a lot, especially like within Microsoft uh, products and, and other operating systems uh, for digital signatures, signatures and key distribution. As a matter of fact, if you're using uh, Secure Shell, for instance, if you're logging into uh, from one computer into another one using SSH, and what happens when you do that, you are gener self-generating your keys. You're not going out to a, a third party getting keys. That, that, that server, it actually generates its own keys. And it uses ECC many times as the uh, method of, of generating the key and uh, facilitating the, uh, the digital signatures and encryption and the key distribution. And I will not get into the math of how these algorithms work because they will make your head hurt. What I will say though with RSA, it really deals, it has to do with factoring prime numbers, okay? And, and the, the complexity associated with trying to reverse factor a prime number, a large prime number. So like we talked about, so it was the, the, the thing is with encryption is really what key exchange. Well, there's a couple of individuals, Diffie and Hellman. They kind of broke the code no pun intended, on how to do key exchange. Because like I say, um, with symmetric encryption, key exchange is, is, is a big deal. So they use the asymmetric methodologies to um, allow two people to receive a symmetric key and these two people don't know each other. You might say, do we do that? You do it every time you go to Amazon, you go to any type of e-commerce, where you want to give them your credit card information and you know you want to shop securely, this is how it's done. This is how you and Amazon are able to exchange keys so that you can now change a some exchange symmetric keys so that you can use AES 128 to do the encryption of your credit card information before it goes across the internet. So how does it work? Well. This is a very, 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 very simplistic example. The, the actual math, much, much, a little bit more in depth. But what we do, we start out with, we will pick a common number. Then this is, think about this as your two computer, as you, as your computer and Amazon. You're getting ready to hit the uh, purchase, you know, what is that? The, the, the cart, shopping cart. Whew. Yeah, there you go. You're going to hit the shopping cart. Yeah, I'm done shopping. I want to pay. Well, the your two the the Amazon server, your computer negotiates a common number. That's the, for this example. We're going to use the number two. All right. So common number is number two that both sides have. Now, what your computer will do is it's going to pick a random number, and let's say four. Now, well, when it was going to raise four a uh, two to the power of four, which is sixteen. Two times two times two times two. 16. And it's going to share that number or a public, that'll become like the public key uh, with the other user or with Amazon. Amazon is basically doing the same thing. It's going to take that same common number. It's going to pick a random number. Let's, let's say it picks five and it does the same thing. It raises two to the power of five, which is two times two times two times two times two which is 32, and it shares that with your computer. So now you guys have exchanged public keys, right? Well, now you take your public key, I mean, take the public key that you got from Amazon, raise it to your random number four, and it's gonna give you 32 to the fourth is 1,048,576. Amazon server is gonna do the same thing. It's gonna take your public key number 16, raise it to the random number that it selected, which is five, 16 to the fifth is 1,048, well, 1,048,576. And look at what we got right there. We have a common number. Now we both, 
know something in common. So now that we know that, now we're able to, I, my computer and the Amazon server is able to take that common number and use it to generate a key, a symmetrical key. And the key will be the same on both ends because it's built off of a common number. And now we have just done key exchange. So when you're out there, that's what happens first is key exchange. So we're using asymmetrical to do key exchange, to generate a way of exchanging the key. Um, and really, and now once the key is exchanged, now, if you notice, that's when you get the little lock in your URL up in the, up in the address, the little green lock, that tells you that key exchange has been done. Now it, your systems flip over to AES-128 and start doing the transaction with symmetric encryption. So we use asymmetrical for key exchange. Why? Because it takes the, the, um, a lot of the management problems out, but we can't really encrypt with it because it's slow. Then once we exchange keys, we go to symmetrical encryption, symmetric encryption, and we ex, um, encrypt the, the payload because it's much faster. All right, I hope that made sense. So that's how we get a shared key or pre-shared pre key. So let's talk about digital signals, signatures a little bit. When we talk about digital signatures, uh, using asymmetric encryption for that, it really is kind of this, this example of Alice and Sam. Sometimes you may, it may be Alice and Bob. It seems like it's always Alice. Alice really gets around. She gets to, there's Bob, there's Sam, and then there's the bad guy. I can't remember the bad guy's name, but Alice. Alice is always giving somebody her keys. Okay, so Alice sends Sam her public key because her public key is what is known to everyone. And then Sam will use Alice's public key to encrypt a message and send it back to her securely. So that is kind of that, that how we use it for encryption. So now when we talk about for digital signatures, a couple of questions we got here. First of all, let's say, how does Alice prove to Sam that a message comes from her? So, I mean, how is Sam supposed to trust Alice and Alice is giving everybody her keys? Hmm? How am I supposed to trust you, Alice? Oh, sorry, I got a little emotional there. All right, but here we go. Well, first, uh, she has to demonstrate that she has her private key because only the person, the authorized person to her should have a private key. So here's what happens. So Alice creates her public and private keys. She distributes her public key with her signature or her name attached so that, that way Sam knows that this is Alice's public key. Now, Alice will encrypt a message using her private key and send the message to Sam. If Sam can decrypt the data with Alice's public key, the message must have been uh, encrypted by Alice with her private key because she's the only one should have the private key. That's called a digital signature. So where you encrypt the message with your private key, send it to someone, their computer decrypts it with, their, with your public key. That shows the relationship between the public and the private key, digital signature. Okay, question number two. How does Alice prove to Sam that she is Alice and she's not Nancy or Joanne or anyone else? Because Sam is really confused now. I don't know who Alice is. I don't know you anymore, Alice. Oh, okay, how does she do that? Demonstrate that she has her private key. All right, here's what Sam does. Sam creates a random number. Well, Sam creates a pseudo random number because there's really no such thing as random when we talk about computers. But anyway, that's a whole different subject. And then he takes this random number, encrypts it with Alice's public key, and sends it to Alice. Because he can get Alice's public key, but how do you, but, so, but he don't know for sure if it's Alice. Now, what Alice should be able to do is Alice should be able to decrypt that random number with her private key and send that random number back to Sam, proving she is Alice because anyone else should not have been able to decrypt that random number. So now Sam is happy, he, you know, because he knows Alice is Alice. Alice is happy because she's taking care of Sam's uh, emotional shortcomings and, and, and everything else. So then they go off and live digitally happily ever after. Okay, let's talk about hashing. No, not the uh, recreational narcotic, but this is uh, how we do other things. 
What is hashing? Hashing is similar to encryption. Yes, it is, but it's a little bit different. Hashing is what we call one-way encryption. I don't know why I have to do my fingers this way. One-way encryption. Uh, now, because before we talked about when we talked about uh, encryption, cryptography, we encrypted and decrypted, which was two-way. Now we're going to do a one-way encryption. And so, with a, what a hash does, it's really it's all about uh, integrity, improving a way of proving that your your information, your message hasn't changed. So, what a hash algorithm will do, it will take a, a message of any length. Um, and when you run it through a hash function, it will produce what we call a digest, a hash digest. And that hash digest is always going to be the same length, the same length every time, depending on which hash algorithm you use. And here's just a, a very simplistic example. I got the word Fox. This, the, the blue is the input. If I input Fox into this hash algorithm, this would give me the output. D, F, C, D, three, four, five. If I took this whole sentence, the red fox runs across the ice. You see, it's still gonna give me a hash digest of the same number of characters, but it's gonna be a different set of numbers and a different set of characters. If I change one word in this, the red fox walks across the ice. Something changed, so now I should get a completely different set of characters in my hash. Now, as long as I run the same input into the hash, I should always get the same output. That's how we ensure integrity. So meaning that if I take a, take a message, right? And I run it through a hash algorithm, let's say MD5, message digest five, that's a hash algorithm. And it gives me this right here, 52ED879E. I send you that message, okay? Not the, dot, not the hash sum. I can send you the hash sum, but I will do that separately. But I'm gonna send you the red fox runs across the ice. You run it through uh, the same hash algorithm, MD5. It should give you the same hash sum, 52ED878. If anything changed in this message along the way, if anything, if somebody put an extra space in there, you know, one letter changed, you're going to get a completely different hash sum. So that's how we prove integrity, meaning that I, I run it through an algorithm, get a hash sum, I send that hash sum and the message to you. You get the message, you run it through the same algorithm, it should produce the same hash sum. And when you compare the hash sums, you go, yep, they're the same. If they're different, you instantly know that something happened in that message to where it's no longer the same. So when we talk about hash algorithms, like I say, um, a couple of different ones we use, uh, secure hash algorithm or SHA, that is really where we're moving to. Uh, MD5, Message Digest 5, that's an older algorithm. Um, it was 128-bit digest. And that, that says that when you run something through it, it the outcome, output is always gonna be 128 bits whether you run one, one bit, one letter, or you run, you know, 500,000 bits or, you know, 2 billion characters, the output is always going to be 128, the digest. Now, like I said, we're moving away from MD5, going to the, the SHA, the Secure Hash Algorithm Series, um, and because it gives you a longer digest. And why is that important? Well, here again, it goes back to workload factor. When you think about um, finality, meaning that 128 bits, there's only so many different combinations or permutations that you can have with 128 bits. So with the computing power we have now, you're able to actually run or, or using multiple computers, figure out every possible combination of 128 bits, which means that now you can come up um, with, with, um, with books and ways of showing we know every possible uh, hash value. Pretty, and that way we can now, we don't need to know the message. If I got the hash value, I can reverse engineer and get to where I want to go. Um, 
So now that's where we start moving to, to different uh, algorithms that's able to give you different lengths of digest, like SHA-256. That's a 256-bit digest. And you can actually go all the way out to SHA-1024. Now, you may say, well, well, that's great. Let's just all go to 1024 and make it secure. Hey, let's go back to what we talked about before, trade-offs. There's always trade-offs, especially with encryption. Always trade-offs because a 1024-bit, that's going to take more time to calculate that um, message digest. So you're trading off security for speed and for processing processing power. But in a nutshell, that's how that works. All right, guys, we have talked about quite a bit when it comes to encryption, haven't we? We've uh, looked at cryptography and some of the terminologies. We talked about the key, key management. Then we went into symmetric encryption uh, that had block and stream uh, methods. We talked about asymmetrical encryption, key management, Diffie-Hellman, how we use Diffie-Hellman for key exchange and how we operate in a, in a um, hybrid environment where we use asymmetric encryption to do key exchange. Once we've exchanged keys, then we can we flip to symmetric encryption to do uh, the bulk encryption or, or, do, or encrypt the payload. Um, and digital signatures, we kind of went over that a little bit as well. Talked about quite a few things tonight. I hope this, uh, helps you out in your uh, in understanding encryption. I know many times this is an area that you can read it over and over and over. Sometimes it's kind of hard to grasp the concept. 